And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning and welcome to the Hump Day edition of the show. It's a, it's going to be a smorgasbord of topics today, covering everything from target-dated mutual funds and why you should run away from them with your hair on fire. Um, <laughs> but also talk a little bit about the jobs data. We've got, what else we got on the list? We got we got a side dish of what this Oh, morning? the economic recovery. Oh, the economic recovery. Yeah, absolutely. can't forget that. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to get into that. We've got a lot of stuff to get into this morning with Danny Ratliff for joining me here in just a few minutes. Um, trying to get the morning started here as we do get into this hump day edition, right? Already rolling into mid-June already. I don't know where this is. I might as well start your Christmas shopping now, um, you know, before everything sells out. Uh, <laughs> if you can get it. If you can get it. Exactly. <laughs> Order early. It's a, hey, maybe this, you know what, this whole supply chain, I'm thinking I just figured it out. Yeah. This, is, this is all a ploy by Amazon to get people to buy stuff early. Probably, so you know, because bringing forward consumption it is actually pulling yes. forward. You know, and how you know how we've started expanding. You know, Black Friday used to be just on Friday, and oh, yeah. now it starts yeah. on like Wednesday, four weeks before that Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazon's you know Prime Day is now two days. <laughs> I mean, come on. Either call it Amazon Prime two days or, you know, go back to one day. I'm afraid this is the supply chain problems yeah. spells the death of twofers. <laughs> no more BOGOs? No more BOGOs. Oh, jeez. There's a bunch of millennials right now going, what's a BOGO? Uh, well, well, YOLO. Buy one, get one. <laughs> it's an old boomer thing. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> Anyway, a uh, couple of things to get into this morning, of course, as we talked about yesterday, you know, the markets continue really just to kind of struggle here. Um, if we take a look at our money flow index, we've been kind of just harping on this over the last couple of weeks because this has really kind of been the telltale story of the overall markets. Markets not really going much of anywhere and really haven't gone anywhere here over the last couple of months, really digesting that big gain that we saw. Um, you know, from the March 2020 lows, um, there's been a very sharp advance in the markets. The market valuations are very elevated. We've talked about this before. Yesterday's article covered the fact that there's a lot of warning signs out there that we're still due for a correction sometime this summer. And, you know, importantly, pay attention to the money flows itself, which have been getting to continually degrading here over the course of, of the last really three, four weeks here. Uh, very close to turning negative at a time where we're about to have a daily sell signal as well. So again, um, you know, the markets uh, look to open up just a little bit this morning, but that's kind of been the, the story here all week. We open up a little bit in the mornings and kind of sell off in the afternoons. Uh, that was the exact action again yesterday. Um, you know, we keep trying to make this attempt to, to break out the new highs, not really quite able to do that just yet. But again, we've eaten up up a lot of that you know potential you know and, and and just to remind you a little bit about how technical analysis works it's not about trying to predict um, what markets are going to do and a lot of people you know look at technical analysis oh it's voodoo right um, all technical analysis is is just an evaluation of price it's and, and remember since the market is driven ultimately by the psychology of investors and this is one of the things that, that we kind of tend to forget about markets is that markets are made up of buyers and sellers and in fact nothing happens without somebody willing to sell something so you know if there's nobody willing to sell anything buyers have to keep bidding up the price to find somebody willing to sell to them that's how markets work and all technical analysis tells you is you know what's happening on that front and, and what we're what that message is right now is that there are fewer and fewer people right now willing to buy or sell um, and there's just the volume of the transactions have gotten very light here as of late money flows are still positive. Well, what does that mean? That means that basically um, buyers are willing to pay up at this point for trying to get um, acquisition of some shares of something, whatever they want to buy, whether it's a Tesla or Microsoft or Amazon, whatever it is. There's buyers willing to pay up a little bit here, but there's plenty of sellers meeting that demand right now. So again, what causes a market to decline? Well, that's when sellers then start to outweigh the number of buyers. And buyers go, you know what? I'm not willing to pay more money here. And sellers go, okay, well, I'll sell a little bit cheaper if you'll buy it from me, right? 
that's how markets actually work. And this is, you know, the issue with the housing market, it's the issue with the stock market, it's the issue with any market. Any market where there's buyers or sellers, it's always the demand or the supply that ultimately changes the price of the good that's being transacted at any point in time. So as we look at this, what this is telling us again, just all this, all this, you know, hoodoo voodoo technical stuff that we're doing, all that's telling us is, is that right now there is a propensity that more selling pressure will show up here sooner rather than later. And that's, you know, we can also see that by looking at, at various sectors of the markets. Here's a, dis, a chart of discretionary stocks, right? So discretionary is an interesting story here because this is retail. Primarily discretion is Amazon uh, today because Amazon is such a big component of the discretionary sector. But the important thing is, is that discretionary stocks really haven't done a whole lot this year, despite the fact we've had record retail sales, right? I mean, we just had just massive retail sales yet, really haven't seen uh, discretionary stocks do a whole lot here. And the reason is uh, ultimately is that, you know, these companies understand that this you know, surge in retail sales is, is likely going to be very temporary. And in fact, the deviation between, you know, incomes and what's happening with the, you know, the stimulus payments that caused this big surge, those are now starting to come back to each other. So again, that's going to cramp discretionary spending going forward. But discretionary stocks back on a sell signal already. See, they're, they're running in advance of the market itself. So, you know, we've got discretionary stocks already signaling that there's going to be a little bit more weakness in both retail sales as well as economic numbers in the coming months ahead as we continue to kind of work through this process of rolling off all of the stimulus. Now, there's more stimulus coming, right? Well, maybe not so much. Uh, yesterday, uh, the talks between the Republican lead and Joe Biden broke down on an infrastructure bill. Now there's a bipartisan group of three Democrats and three Republicans, uh, Man uh, Joe Manchin being on one of the Democrats. Um, and Lisa Murkowski on the Republican side trying to come up with their own infrastructure bill. Now, that infrastructure bill looks like it's going to be somewhere around $900 billion. That's roughly, you know, half of Joe Biden's last proposal at $1.7 billion, much less than the original $2.2 trillion that was set up for infrastructure. And there was a lot of bets here that we we're going to have all this influx of money coming in because remember, the original Biden infrastructure plan wasn't really infrastructure. It was 5 or 6% infrastructure. The rest of it was a lot of social engineering, a lot of additional household money, those type of things that would have provided a boost to the economy short term as that money worked its way in the system. But now without that, and the fact that it's now just $900 billion, and that's, mind you, spread out over 10 years. So that's $900 billion over 10 years, that's $90 billion a year, really in a $22 trillion economy, that's not a big boost. So again, you're not going to get a lot of bang for the buck out of an infrastructure bill of this size, and more importantly, because as, as uh, Barack Obama found out when he did an infrastructure bill, A, jobs aren't so shovel ready, and B, there's just a lot of red tape with trying to get government funding into infrastructure. If you want infrastructure to work, what you do is really simple. It's a lot less costly. You provide tax credits to companies to privatize your infrastructure and say, hey, if you'll build a, a, a power plant or a nuclear plant, we'll give you tax credits to do it. That's how you build infrastructure, and that's how you get it done efficiently, effectively, and most importantly, productively, and that's what creates economic growth. But again, this is where we are. we got a lot of stuff to get into this morning, but pay attention here because our yesterday's article on the website, if you didn't get it, Technical Speaking Tuesday, is all the reasons, uh, the warnings, why we may have a correction coming here a bit sooner than later. And don't forget to tune in later this morning for our three minutes on Markets and Money. We'll go through this sector by sector as well. Be right back. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. You could be one of the 7 in 10 people requiring long-term care in your lifetime. Are you prepared for nursing home care costs averaging more than $7,600 a month? Our next virtual lunch and learn will cover the management of long-term care expenses that could make or break your retirement. Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for the basics of long-term care. Long-term care. Register at realinvestmentadvice.com. 
realinvestmentadvice.com for our virtual lunch and learn on long-term care. June 24th at noon, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. <laughs> 617 this morning as we walk by the show. Danny Ratliff joining me this morning. Headline on CNN right now. Rioter feels threatened by hero police officer. Yeah, well, if you weren't rioting, he probably wouldn't have threatened you. <laughs> Just kind of goes hand in hand. You know, you, throw rocks and, you start throwing rocks and breaking windows, you may get threatened. <laughs> hey, there's no room for common sense here, okay? I know. Uh, speaking of common sense... Um, you know, I've, I've told you stories about my kids from time to time and things that, that go on in the household just to kind of break up some of the monotony of finance every day. So, you know, I try to teach my kids good life lessons. So, you know, and Dan, and, and, I, and I save some of these stories for Danny because he's got young kids, right? It, how old's your oldest now? Six? Eight. Seven, eight. Eight. Getting old. Six and man, four. Almost to seven and five. Crazy. Man, just creeping up. I know. Um, so I tell Danny these stories so that he knows what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yesterday I'm at work and my uh, 17 year, 18 year old daughter. She just turned 18. Uh, you know, I, I tell you that I, I make my kids work. Right, they have to go get jobs when they turn 16, and they've got to pay for their own car notes. They've got to pay for their own insurance for their car. They pay for their own gas. You know, they they don't get they don't get mommy and daddy bailouts anymore, right? And and used to be when then this is the part you're going to go through is that and you're going through it now, right? You're 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 what I call a duber, right? That's a dead Uber. Okay. Right? So you got to yeah. haul your kids around oh, everywhere, yeah. right? Everywhere. And, and when they start getting like friends, like around, you know, intermediate school, you start driving them all over the place, right? To go hang out with their friends or do stuff, right? So you're a duber and that's, you, you'll get through that. Well, as soon as they turned 16 and got cars, I was like, hey, duber's over, <laughs> right? You're, you drive yourself. In fact, go pick up your sister <laughs> over here. And go fill and, up your tank. And you fill up your tank and take your other sister over here to do this, right? So... They're now their own Ubers. So, but anyway, so they're having to pay for all this and, and they've got their, you know, their online checking accounts and, you know, this, that they've got their debit card that they can use and all this. So we've got them all set up, right? They're adulting for the most part. Well, so yesterday I get this phone call and, and uh, my daughter says, I'm about to go down to my work and I'm about to give them two cents in my mind. And I'm like, well, before you go give them two cents, let's make sure you have two cents to give them. <laughs> And I said, what's the problem? And she goes, they, they shorted me on my paycheck, right? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, I'm, I made you know, uh, $350 this week, and I'm short $48.23. And I'm like, how do you know you're short? She goes, well, here's the value of my bank account, right? So she shoots me a screenshot of her bank account. And, and sure enough, there's a $48.23 difference between her paycheck and what's actually in her bank account. Shocking. And I said, okay. I said, well, there, there apparently is a discrepancy. Send me your pay stub. So she sends me your pay stub. I go through it. Pay stub's correct. And I go, do me a favor. Go online and look at your transaction history on your bank account and tell me what you see. And I said, do you see your deposit of your bank check? She says, yes, right here. It's 353 is the exact amount of what her paycheck was. I said, ah, okay. I said, well, what comes after that? She goes, well, there's a Starbucks charge for $23. And then there's this thing called an NSF fee. I, I don't know what that is. And I go, that's called a non-sufficient funds fee. And that is a $25 charge from your bank. And so when you add it all up, it's $48.23, oh, the difference. And she goes, well, I've never heard of that before. I go, well, welcome to being an adult. <laughs> That's what happens when you use other people's money. <laughs> exactly. I said, I said, I've been telling you, and this is something I've been trying to tell her for a while now, because again, you know, this is the one thing I think that we do, just, and, and now, the, now the lesson, right? I think we do a very big disservice to our children. Um, and there's, there's really not a lot of way around this because of just where we are in society today and how things work. But, you know, when Danny and I were growing up, you went and worked, you mowed a yard, somebody paid you $20 in cash, right? So you had a $20 bill to spend. And, and when you would go to spend it, I mean, you spend 20 bucks and you get back your change and that's what you've got left. So you knew what you had in cash. The problem with debit cards, and this is, this is really a big problem from a financial planning perspective as well for, you know, all adults, is that you just throw this debit card around and you don't really understand, there's not that direct link between what you have to spend right. and what you're actually spending. And so you wind up often, you have what's called leakage, right? It's 
that $5 a day Starbucks habit that you just don't think about. It's just $5, no big deal. $5, five days a week, $25 a week, $100 a month, $1,200 a year, huh? <laughs> you know, it adds up pretty quick. And all of a sudden, that really impacts your budget. And, and this is a hard part I've been trying to, I've been telling my kids, I said, look, set some money aside into a separate account because you're, you're not going to save money because of your debit habit. And it is. It's Chick-fil-A. It's Starbucks. It's, you know, it's easy. It's quick, right? Coming home from work, grab something to eat, oh, you yeah. know, go home. But it eats into that budget. And so yesterday's was that first list. She goes, oh, now I understand what you're talking about. Well, and, it, and that overdraft fee was a nice $25 reminder of pay attention to what your budget is. Yeah, that's a hard lesson to learn, but a, probably a really good one. I'll give you an example. My four-year-old, we, we moved last year. And yeah, he makes him work, by the way, four years old. He's oh, I do. Grinding, I've got a great story on this. 40 hours we, a week grinding it out. We could spend out. all day on this. But <laughs> he, my, my father promised when we moved, he said, look, we left the play yard. He said, I'll buy you guys a play yard. He has not done so as of yet. So if you're listening... <laughs> Joseph knows. And, <laughs> and so he said, Dad, Dad, I was working at home the other day. He said, hey, I was, I was at the table having lunch. And he said, open your computer. And uh, he says, pull up some play yards. So he pulls up this, these play yards. And, of course, he goes to, like, the biggest pirate ship you've ever seen. <laughs> it's $23,000. I had to remind him that that is more than most people make. And you will not be ever, ever getting a $23,000 play yard. Um, so the $21,000 pay yard, though, it's on its way via Amazon. No, no, no. <laughs> this, this is the best part. This goes to show you like how their little minds work and yeah. thinking about like how it's, it's so important to teach them the value of a dollar, but it's also so difficult because they see us on the computer, order things for them, do things, and stuff just shows up at the door. So later that evening, he comes, hey, Dad, where's the truck? I said, the truck? What are you talking about? He goes, yeah, the truck with all the guys. I said, what guys? <laughs> with, with my play yard. I was like, wait a second, hold on. Yeah, you ordered it earlier online. I was like, no, 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 that did not happen. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, you did. I saw you. And I was like, but that shit, it's so interesting. It's in, it's like yesterday, last night at dinner, I'm telling him, I said, hey, look, if you want nice things, you're gonna have to work for it, and and you're gonna have to work hard. So I said, I'm gonna pay you a dollar to unload the dishes, but you have to finish the job. And that's the number one rule to all of them that you have to yeah. finish the job to get paid. So he gets about halfway through, and I said, look, man, you're not gonna get paid for doing this. So. He, he goes and gets his big brother and big sister and starts trying to barter with them, saying he's going to give half their, his money. I was actually pretty proud of that aspect because he, did, he was able to break it down at four years old. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. So, yeah, he goes in the, in the other room and says, hey, guys. I mean, he's a little, he's a little negotiator. I was pretty shocked. Well, you know, but the thing is, what really made you proud is, is that if he had done half the job, right, he gets 50 cents, right? Yeah. He should have borrowed for 25 cents to get them to, to you know, that get, been make impressive. a profit on the labor, right? Yeah. That's that's the trick. That would have been very <laughs> impressive. Yeah. He did get his sister to come help, help me, but I think she just felt sorry for me. So, <laughs> so no, but anyway, the, the, these are the things that we run into. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's an interesting, you know, it's a, the, the byline of this is interesting from the standpoint that, you know, we, we often forget – you know, as you know, we're raising children to teach them good financial lessons. This is one of my big pet peeves, and I've talked about this on the show before, is, you know, teaching kids finance and, you know, teaching kids to invest. And there's been a kind of a big push lately in the media about teach your kids to invest, you know, uh, start them out young. And now even Fidelity's uh, coming out now and uh, giving the parents the ability, if you have a Fidelity account, um, you can now open up an investment account for a child as young as 13 years of age. That's fine. I think that's completely okay. But approach the investing process from teaching them to learn how to invest. One of my biggest pet peeves are these school programs where they have a semester on finance and they have an investing game for the, for the semester. And the way you win that game is to buy penny stocks and hope they go up over the course of the semester. We're not teaching kids to invest. We're teaching them how to gamble. And this is, the, this is what's been migrated now into Robinhood, um, where we now have an entire generation of young, young people that have never been through a bear market, don't understand, don't understand the risk that they're taking. And one of the bylines of a bull market is, is that bull markets cover up your investing mistakes. You can buy stocks that have no value and they'll go up in price, but eventually you're going to pay that price. It's just a function of time. And you know, the problem is, is when you destroy a big chunk of capital, especially for young people, two things happen. One, it takes them a long time to get back to where they were. And second, 
the 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 primary psychology of of an impact of a crash is that they walk away from the market and say, well, that's a complete scam. I'm never doing that again. And they don't invest. They stay in cash. And and look, if you don't believe me, ask Danny. We have clients coming into our firm all the time that says, well, you know, I've been out of the market since 2009 and I think I should get back in now. Right. That is a psychological impact of what a bear market does to people. That is not uncommon. It is not wrong. It is, is what happened after the Depression. It's what happened after 1974 um, and that crash. Did you realize that in 1999, 80% of the investors that were in the markets in 1999 had not made their first investment until 1995 after the crash of 74? 90% of the people in the markets today started after the crash of 2008. There's just a tremendous number of people that never came back after the crash. So this is what crashes do, and this is why it's important. If you're going to teach kids to invest, that's great. But here's the rules. First, you teach them to work. As Danny was just saying, go pay them to do a job. Make sure they complete the job, then pay them. From the payment, teach them to do three things. Save money. So tell them to save a third. Put it into a piggy bank. Save it up for something down the road. They can spend a third. It's not worth it. Children don't learn the value of working if you don't allow them to spend the money. So let them spend a third of their money on whatever they want to spend it on. Right? Doesn't matter. If they want to go buy ice cream with it, fine. Let them buy it. Let them learn the value and the joy of actually working and getting paid and having that benefit of buying something. Three, teach them to be charitable. Um, Once you do those three things, then teach them to take those savings and invest into an index fund and let that fund grow over time. Teach them a regular contribution method to that fund. The important thing about teaching them to invest into an index is it teaches them about how the markets work, why markets go up, why markets go down, what happens, but they don't run the risk of losing all of their money and investing into a stock like an AMC or a GameStop. Fun while it lasts, terrible results in the end, eventually what happened. Be back after the break, pick up on this story and a whole lot more with Danny Ratliff, don't go away. The Real Investment Show. You could be one of the 7 in 10 people requiring long-term care in your lifetime. Are you prepared for nursing home care costs averaging more than $7,600 a month? Our next virtual lunch and learn will cover the management of long-term care expenses that could make or break your retirement. Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for the basics of long-term care. Long-term care. Register at realinvestmentadvice.com for our virtual lunch and learn on long-term care. June 24th at noon. Realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. So this morning, I'm Rose Central Roberts. Sandy Ratliff joining me. So, um, moving a little bit past the the kid stories for a moment, um, it does bring up another point about saving and investing. We we, we kind of wound up this, uh, the segment talking about teaching your kids to invest the right way. And you know, it's interesting. You know, right now we're in this part of the cycle where individuals are doing the same things we've seen previously, right? Um, you know, there's, you know, headlines every day are about, you know, these, you know, kind of Wall Street Reddit guys, these these young kind of millennials and Gen Zers, they're, you know, they're buying games, seeing game stock, and, you know, they're putting it to the man right now, right? We saw the same thing in 1999. There was a Forbes cover article. I've got an article I'm writing about this, but there was a Forbes article cover um, talking about how the young kids were taking it to Wall Street. And this is when E-Trade and online trading had first started, right? So, I mean, you know, things are never different. They're, they're different. They seem to be different at the moment, the heat of the moment, um, but they never are. And one thing that we come up with in these kind of peaks of markets, and this is what occurred after the dot-com crash, and then it was really accelerated after the financial crisis, as we come up with in new investment vehicles, right? So in the heat of the moment, there's a demand on the Wall Street for product. And, and let's, let's be very clear, Wall Street is a business. 
They're there to sell you a product. So if you're showing up saying, I want the most aggressive fund I can buy, I want, I want a fund that is full of bankrupt stocks that are going up in price, they'll build it for you, right? They don't care what the end result is. They'll build you the fund and they'll sell it to you. When it blows up, that's on you, not on them, right? You'll blame them for it, but it's your fault for wanting to buy it. But if you want to buy something, they're going to build you a product. Special purpose acquisition companies, SPACs, right? Record number of issuance. Why? Because there's a demand for it. If there's a demand by, by people, retail investors, for a product, Wall Street's going to provide it. And they're going to make money at it. And that's why Wall Street ultimately always wins these games. One of those products that you need to be very careful of is in your 401k plan. And this was a function of a development that occurred after 1999 when the um, markets blew up during the dot-com bust. A lot of people started being very upset about their 401k plan performance because they lost a tremendous amount of money in their 401k plan because nobody was giving them advice. Nobody was, and there was a lot of these very speculative funds that were inside these 401k plans. And then after the financial crisis, this really accelerated um, as well because people were starting to sue their 401k companies for not giving them advice, not providing, um, you know, kind of providing that fiduciary responsibility to people in their 401k plans. Now, look, I, I don't like 401k plans. These were an invention that started back in the 1990s through a tax loophole, and it was basically a way for corporations to get away from having to provide a pension, which was invested into bonds, which guaranteed you a retirement income at retirement. They said, you know, hey, you know what? We don't have to fund it now. We'll put it all on you. And that was the worst thing that, and I'm not opposed to 401k plans as you using one. I'm saying that they were not a great shift from providing the corporate benefit of working for a company and having a pension. They shoved it all onto the retail investor who make bad investment decisions. They don't contribute to the plans. Out of all the 401k plans that are out there, only 25% of the people actually contribute to their plan. So it's just a very small participation rate. And this is why we look at 401k balances on average. Most people don't even have one year salary saved up. So it's been a very big disservice to workers, 401k plans. Well, it has. And even Ted Bennett, the guy who created it, mm -hmm. and actually created it back in the, the 80s as a way to shelter additional funds. It was never intended to, to take the place the, of yeah. it. Yeah, he's, he even says it's gone way awry. And if you look at, um, you know, just the numbers of what's happened over the years, you know, people stepping away from the pensions because it places the burden on the investor. And, you know, going to what these target date funds are intended for, you, know, you talk about the fiduciary duty and how yep. some of these funds were sued. You had funds that were assuming that you were retired back in 2008. They were losing 30 and 40%. That's not a very good <laughs> assumption there or very good education surrounding it. And the crazy thing is that even to, to today, Lance, that mm -hmm. they are still considered the qualified default investment alternative, yep. which therefore protects the business owner as the fiduciary. It protects them saying, well, if you have this as a default, you're going to be OK. They can't somebody can't come after you. Right. So let me explain that real quick. Just see what, what, they, what you mean by that is Correct. That when you when you sign up for your 401k plan, if you just stick money in your 401k plan and don't make an allocation choice, it goes to a target date goes. fund based on your retirement age. Right. So your retirement age is 10 years from now. Today's 2020. They put you in a 2030 target date fund. Now, the reality of this is and there's two big problems with target dates. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's one of the issues is, is is that you don't know what's going to happen when you get there. But the other is is that they're potentially moving money into assets that are that are not going to be performing well for you over the next. Well, 10 years. they're not all created equal, and so this right. goes back to modern portfolio theory that was created back you know seven in the seventies that has changed substantially because the world has changed substantially, right? And you know I think some of the bigger issues are is that all of these are on a glide path. I mean, you guys. If you've listened to the show for any amount of time, you know that I have a, a very large disdain for these funds. And, and, and the reason being is because, one, they're not all created equal. And I, don't, I think they're more of a marketing scheme than they are an actual truly good investment for most people because you don't actually know what you have until you look under the hood. If you can look at some of the biggest ones out there, which we've done and compared side by side here, they are, you know, it presents a picture that so shows you, wow, maybe they're not exactly what I thought they were. Mm -hmm. And so many people are calling them a ticking time bomb. I think that's exactly what they are. And it's unfortunate because they've grown so much right. over the years. And so, because you know, people don't know different. People look at no. it and go, oh, that's, uh, if I invest in this fund, then when I get to that target date, then I'll have all my money. And see, this is the thing that people forget about it. See, people think this target date fund means that that value of that fund is going to be there at that target date. That's not what it means, right? That's not what it means at all. If, well, if they think target, it's going to get more conservative each year. 
you're getting to that time, right? Right. But where, how do you get more conservative? You move it into bonds, which are having lower and lower rates of return. Right? Negative this year, right? And negative this year. And potentially, if we do have a sharp spike in rates, as you get closer and closer to your retirement date, it's pushing more and more money into a potential asset that has a lower rate of return and potential downside risk. So if you happen to, have an, if you happen to be retiring in a year where you have a sharp interest rate pop, you know, you could serve a, a fairly big loss in that fund. And so, you, you, again, to Danny's point, you've got to really understand what you're getting into and understand the risk that you're taking to get there. So let me ask you this. So if, if you are in a target date 2020 fund, how much do you think you have in equities? Target date 2020? Mm-hmm. Probably 20%. 67.5%. Really? Yeah. That's not, that's not what a target date's supposed to do. Well, Ideally, they're supposed to, they're on a, what they call a glide path. And so right. all of them are, are different. That's the other part of not being created equal. Everybody's glide path changes at different times. Now, you would think this would be much more conservative, and, and clearly it, it's not. And they're going to have you in lots of different areas, yeah. even if, you know, like if we don't like an area, most firms out there will say, look, we're going to have a very strategic allocation. And then tactically, we're going to move up and down around it. Whereas we, we invest a little bit differently and say, well, if we don't like something, we're going to probably just remove it. And many places don't do that. And that's that's one of the problems with these target date funds as well, is that they're always going to have to have a a basically a placeholder that they have to fill. Regardless of, of markets, regardless of the situation, they're going to always be invested in these. And so that's another one of the problems, Lance, that we see with this is that you think you're getting one thing, but you're getting something much different. They a lot of times claim that there's actually active money management within it. And what they mean by that is that they may increase or decrease by a couple percentage points here and there. Right. They're not actually physically actively managing. And the problem, the other issue is that most people are overwhelmed by the 401k plans. There's very little education around it. Um, you know, I know you had Tom Allen here on Mondays now talking a little bit about retirement plans, the things that we do in-house. I think this is a very important thing for people to realize what they're investing in. And then what can you do about it? It's going to take a little bit of work, but... Um, well, uh, it's worth it. Yeah, and, that, and that's why you know we're really excited about it. Uh, so we're about to roll out an all-new Real Investment Advice website here soon. And on that uh, new website is an entire page of retirement plan help, um, whether it's a, a plan that you're currently in or you need the, the, our 401k plan manager with you know eight different models to choose from, whether you want to be aggressive or conservative. It's all going to be there on, on one page, plus a complete resource, a complete set of resources. You know, Danny's going to write articles about, you know, retirement date funds, right? And yeah. the, those those articles from Tom and Danny and Richard are all going to be on that page as well. So we've got a whole big resource coming on the new Real Investment Advice website that we'll be launching here in the next few weeks. So keep a watch out for that. Well, and, and the, the other aspect of this is that's one of the reasons why we actually started managing 401ks this last quarter, because we had so many people come to us saying, look, you know, I, I don't want to be in this target date fund. I need to start thinking about, you know, where should I be investing funds? I don't have the time to do it. So I need somebody that does. And I think that's a big part of it, yeah. you know, trying to expand the services that we've offered as well over time. And look, these target date funds, I, I get it. It's the easy alternative. Um, but just understand, go and look and see what you're invested in. Because, you know, if you're looking at that 2020 fund and thinking that, oh, yeah, I'm in retirement or even the income fund in retirement, I think most people are going to be pretty shocked. <laughs> exactly. Well, and again, it's, it's always about knowing. And this is the problem, you know, ultimately with 401k plans is that they're, you know, generally what happens is the plan gets signed up with somebody and then, everybody disappears and there, there is no help. There is no guidance, right? There's nobody to call and, and ask. I mean, every week we put a 401k plan manager inside of our newsletter that we send out. So if you subscribe at our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the newsletter link, put your email address in, we'll email you our newsletter. At the bottom is a 401k allocation model. And the reason we do that is because you know, we have a tremendous number of people every week watch and follow that model. It's free. Why not? Because they're not getting help anywhere else. So, you know, at least they have something, some model to kind of guide them, you know, and, and that's why we're going to expand this with this new retirement tab. We've had so many people ask, you know, we run a 60-40 model in that allocation, but people ask us like, do you have a more aggressive model? Do you have a more conservative model? I'm young, you know. So, yes, we're going to expand that to, to eight different models so you'll have things to choose from. Um, and you can, and, and then as we adjust those allocations, you can adjust yours as well and keep yourself on track for retirement because that's the whole goal here, right? If we can get everybody to retirement healthy, safe and wealthy we've done a good job that's that's the whole goal so all right quick break we we'll come back we've got to talk a little bit about wrapping up you know the the economic recovery is here what does that mean and um so we'll talk about that as we wrap up today's edition of the real investment show danny ratliff joining me be right back Ready? 
Listening to the Real Investment Show. You could be one of the seven in ten people requiring long-term care in your lifetime. Are you prepared for nursing home care costs averaging more than seventy-six hundred dollars a month? Our next virtual lunch and learn will cover the management of long-term care expenses that could make or break your retirement. Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for the basics of long-term care. Long-term care. Register at realinvestmentadvice.com for our virtual lunch and learn on long-term care. June. 24th at noon. Realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Uh, markets are looking to open. Eh, uh, eh, a little flat again this morning. It's been, it's been a, the most boring week. In the markets, I mean, literally, they've just been flat all week and not really making much progress. But again, uh, this is kind of what we talked about earlier in our three minutes on market and our market open. But uh, also something we'll touch on today in our three minutes on markets and money is just where the markets go to next. Um, so, but the the economic recovery, right? Um, we're going to see some pretty amazing numbers here over the course of the next uh, few weeks as we get further into the summer. Uh, CPI, um, which is due out, is going to be a massive surge. And it's not a function that prices are really skyrocketing through the roof, right? Prices are up, don't get me wrong. But when you look at the CPI index, it's gonna, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I mean, we're back to the 70s. It, just calm down for a second because part of this, a big chunk of it, is the fact that we're comparing on a year-over-year basis of inflation. So what was inflation last year at this time? Remember, we were shut down. There was no inflation. We had deflation, right? Prices were falling very rapidly because there was no demand at all because we shut the economy down. So the year-over-year base effects um, are huge. So you're going to see a lot of this type of analysis. Um, the economic recovery is big, right? Because we're comparing to last year's shutdown and we were down 30, uh, 32% in the second quarter of, of 2020. So now you're going to see this big year over year gain in GDP. It's going to be huge. We've seen all this stuff before. Right. I mean, the, you know, like I talked about earlier about the, the Wall Street traders back in 1999, right? The retail investors taking advantage of Wall Street. You know, what's happening with Reddit and, and AMC and GameStop? It's not new. We've seen all this stuff before. Well, none, none of these things are new. I mean, in fact, it, you know, I always find it a good a good experience or experiment to go go Google Time Magazine, The Vault, and just type in economy. And there's so many things that come up that you know, it puts things in perspective a little bit. You know, if you go back and we'll just go back a little bit in time, go back to the 70s. It says, now where are the jobs? Is the U.S. going broke? Uh, the $400,000 election, a national disgrace. Food prices, the big, the big beef, recessions, greetings. You know, uh, these continue. I mean, we can get even closer, you know, to, to, you know, things that we just experienced not too long ago that we all forget, you mm -hmm. know, looking at Social Security. Is it time to make a change? Um, you know, the, the list goes on and on. But I think, you know, one of the important things you mentioned earlier is that we've been here. Um, you know, we're, we're not experiencing something completely new now. How we're going about it, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned back how in the, the late 90s, how things changed just with E-Trade. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. People able to actually trade on their own a little bit without calling their broker. You know, some of the best things that happened like in, in October, what, of, of 87, was that many people couldn't get a, get a hold of their broker to get out of the market. <laughs> right. And luckily it came back and actually ended up that year. You know, but yet one day it was down 23%. But the list goes on. I mean, I would encourage everybody to go just to give yourself a little perspective. You know, um, I think this is a positive thing mm -hmm. to understand where we've been and, and how we got to where we are, but to realize that it's not all that different. I mean, there may be different things that are ma making this happen. I mean, obviously we know the debt yeah. is an issue. Uh, fiscal monetary policy is going to be huge, but how long can that go? You know, speaking of the debt, um, uh, you know, this past weekend was the remembrance of D-Day, the D-Day invasion, right? June the 6th. And so, I was doing the my traditional habit of watching 
you know, war movies <laughs> on D-Day. And so I was watching, I, I had never seen our Flags of Our Fathers before. Um, it was one of those that I had been on my watch list and never had a chance to watch it. And so I sat down and I watched it. Um, actually, outside of the fact that it was a, a, a really well done movie, right? Um, it had a very big economic component to it about World War II. And this is what we forget about our spending today. We're $28 trillion in debt. We're spending like drunken sailors, just to use the term uh, at this point. But, you know, we're spending very rapidly, and right? We don't really seem to have a consequence or a concern about the money that we're spending. And it's interesting, if you watch the movie Flags of Our Fathers, it's the story about the these three soldiers that raised the flag um, in World War II, uh, sorry, yeah, in World War II, and that was the Time magazine cover, right? It's and and they're now on a tour, coming back. They come back to the United States and they're on a tour to sell war bonds, because, because, and there's a whole clip in this movie that's so great. They their their commanders talking to them and says, "Look, you've got to go do this. We are 14 billion dollars in debt." And we are concerned. I mean, we're going broke as a government. And if you don't go sell war bonds, your buddies aren't going to get the bullets and the food and the stuff that they need to fight this war. You need to go sell these war bonds. And we're fourteen billion. And they had and they were concerned that they were going to that we were going to go default as a nation at fourteen billion in debt. <laughs> now we're at twenty eight trillion and counting. <laughs> so, you know, again, very big difference of concern. And and, and if you look back, there's a chart. You'll see them all the time. Uh, debt to GDP ratio. Um, we are now at the highest level of debt to GDP since that point in time in World War II, where we were very, spending a lot of money on the war effort. Big difference, though. Big difference between today and World War II is, is back then we were spending money to promote a war effort. It was productive, right? We were putting the, the the women were going to work in factories to produce everything that we needed for the war effort. You couldn't buy tires or cheese or clothes. They all everything was going to the war effort. So every dollar we were spending was creating a massive amount of economic growth out of it, and the economy was growing at nine percent plus at that point in time. Um, today, most of the money we're spending, in fact, one hundred actually more then 100 cents on the dollar of every tax dollar we bring in goes just to social welfare, which is non-productive. So those are the differences between today and back then. But it's a great movie to watch if you want a little bit of an economic perspective about our economy. But to Danny's point, today's not any different. It's just we're doing things differently that have potentially a different outcome and a different result. Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the big things that we're hearing from this is what happens with inflation. So we actually had a question on the YouTube channel. If you have questions, you can go there. We do try to answer these live. Um, so go to the Real, the Real Investment Show on YouTube. Uh, but Colin has a question. Is when do we believe the CPI prints will return to normal or start to dip? Next year. Next year. And that's going to be because over time it's going to become deflationary. Because of we're yeah, going year over year, right? Yeah. Well, so everything will go back to, to so basically next year. So when we get to 2022, it's a great question. Um, you know, and you'll see it actually before the end of this year. Actually, in the third quarter of this year, you're going to start to see these these inflationary numbers begin to drop because we had a 33 percent surge in GDP in the third quarter, which inflation also started coming back in the third quarter of last year as well. So the year over year comparisons are going to start to slow down. So instead of it being a five or 6% print, it'll be a 3% print. And then by 2022, we're going to be back to 2% ish growth in the economy and inflation will return back to those kind of levels. And then by 2023, we'll be at sub 2% because of the debt. Um, and that's even where the Federal Reserve projects right now, the long term outlook for for economic growth from the Federal Reserve right now is 1.8%. So well, and, and that's a, that's another kind of segue into something else because I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions from people saying, "Well, look, we have money on the sideline. What do you think about tips? Um, you know, where where do we go right now to fight off inflation?" And you know, really, we're probably too late to the game in that aspect, well, right? That's, well, that's the other part about in, inflation as well is that you know a lot of the run in inflation is is a factor of two folds, right? So if if you know what happens in the economy in terms of inflation is that when people think there's inflation, they run out and they start making inflationary bets, which actually increases the inflationary push. Because remember, most of your prices of inflation come from where? Commodities, right? So 
where do commodity prices come from? That comes from Wall Street, right? So people are buying pork bellies and coffee futures and lumber futures, and they're driving up the price of the stuff, which translates into the price of stuff that's selling in the open market. So part of the inflationary push we're getting is what is what we call reflexivity. It's a George Soros term. But that is the psychology impact on inflation itself. So part of this is being driven by our own our own psychology. The other part of it, though, there is obviously supply chain disruptions and those type of things. And then, of course, it's the year over year, you know, changes that we're looking at because we're comparing to a very blown out quarter last year. But the Fed's also I'm, I'm hate to and, use the word manipulating, but well, they and that was I'm sorry, and that was the other part I missed is that. The Fed's been buying massive amounts of tips. And yeah. when you have a massive buyer in a bond market that's very illiquid in terms of tips, um, that's going to move prices up and bring yields up. So you know, so what's happening is a lot of the inflationary push in um, tips is actually coming from the Fed. So if you're an investor looking to get into to those areas, you may have a small window of time as long as the psychology is still there. But if the Fed yeah. steps away or... You start getting those numbers; those prints do run a little bit, yeah. you know, slower. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't chase tips at this point. I mean, you know, the the upside potential in tips is pretty much stripped out now, so you're not going to make a lot of gain in it. Yeah. And you know that, you know, that was a great trade back in 2020, but you know, it's it's a little bit late to that game now. So I wouldn't be chasing tips here. I think there's better opportunities. You know, the equity market's still performing right now, and I think we're going to get you know a, a correction this summer. Um, we've been talking about this on the show here. We get a 5 to 10% pullback sometime this summer. This is very likely. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? So just because it doesn't happen, don't yeah. you, well, you said it was going to happen. Um, I'm just saying the markets are kind of set up for at least a 3, 4, 5 you know, percent correction. Could be more. Um, but, you know, the market's not going to fall apart. But I think there's a better buying opportunity later this summer um, to put some money to work. And I think you'll perform better, you know, buying equities at this part of the cycle versus you know, tips. Now, the caveat to that is, is that if the Fed comes out and does something that we're completely not anticipating, which is they come out and just automatically say, hey, we're tapering. Um, that's a possibility. But I don't think that's a, a reality at this juncture because they don't want to they don't want to script the market. Well, they have to be looking far enough ahead as well to understand that, you know, at some point this is going to slow down. These yeah. numbers aren't there. I mean, that's well, what they, they've Fed... been saying it's transient. Yeah, right. Correct. And I think they're right. I, n I don't often agree with the Fed, but I agree with them on this one. So, <laughs> this is the one time you'll be wrong. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. It's, it, has, it's not the one time. I've been wrong plenty of times before. Uh, all right. Wraps up the show for the day. 68, Danny Ratliff joining us this morning. Uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow, of course, for Thursday's edition with Michael Leibowitz. We will talk about Fed, the taper, why you should own bonds now as well. Um, that's the conversation for tomorrow. But uh, stick around at the website. Our latest articles and blog posts are up. Our newsletter's there. Of course, if you need help with your 401k plan, need help on anything actually at all, just send us your questions, comments, emails. Happy to help you at all. Realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's a rich man's world.